Okay, thank you very much, Annie. So, yeah, so I'm going to talk about chronic neuropistols recording and just to give a little background, the, there's a classic dichotomy in how you can perform um, neuropixels or in general electrophysiology recording is you can either do perform acute recordings, which is basically you take the animal, you insert the probe and at the end of the day or at the end of the recording, you take it out. So it's not attached um, semi-permanently to the animal. In this, so this is what Carolina is going to talk about right after me. I'm going to mainly talk about uh, chronic ones where the probe is actually attached to the head of the animal and moves with it. And um, yeah, so the outline is pretty simple. This is a short talk. I've given a longer talk last year. Feel free to check it, uh, where I give a little bit more information, especially on the surgery part. And there's also like previous talk from Dario and so on who've, who've been uh giving a lot of details on surgery so i'm going to give an overview here first a quick introduction and some general principles then i'm going to give you some results of the current uh, uh state of the art of these chronic implants as much as i can do and then talk about the few challenges um that are still there so some introduction here yeah, one one question that you may wonder is why would you want to do uh chronic recordings i think there's a lot of reasons why you may want to do those. One is very obvious, is if you want to record from freely moving animals. This is, for example, one implant that's been designed in the Cheshunt lab, the first one for a recoverable, recoverable chronic implants, where you see a mouse here moving in an arena and uh, a neuropixel uh, probe is in its brain right now recording uh, what's happening. Another reason why may be to record across long periods of time, across days and months, this is an image that Matteo showed already, and this is uh, two neurons, one here, one there, that have been recorded in the visual cortex across, in that case, up to 10 days, but actually it's across almost a year. Uh, and you can see that they retain their preference for certain images, like this one is not responding to this image, but responding to this image. So you can track the evolution or the stability of activity in the brain across days. Another reason why is, as you've seen, and it's been discussed in the previous talks, is if you, for example, work with Neopixels 2.0 probes with four shanks, you can only record from a selection of channels from them. So let's say you're interested in recording from big sections of the brain, like the whole brain approach. You can actually implant it chronically, and then on each day record from different brain areas. As you can see here, I recorded from the bottom first, and then slightly higher, and so on and so forth, to map actually this whole brain region uh, which in that case was the frontal cortex and below, to record a lot of neurons. There are other reasons why we may want to also chronically implant these, pr these probes to record brain activity across context, like when the mouse is freely moving and also in your rig that's very well controlled. Also, if you want to share mice across experimenters, which we do a lot in the lab. There are two main ways to perform uh, these chronic implants. Uh, you have permanent implants where the probe is actually cemented to the skull and you can't recover it. These are very stable, but you lose the probe. And reusable implants or recoverable implants, where uh, they, you use a little device to try to uh, recover the probe at the end. And I'm mainly going to talk about these. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the general principles of these implantations. I'm going to start with the permanent implant, which is pre pretty simple. Again, I, I've given more details on this in previous uh, uh, talks and also um, Dario Campagna and so on have, have talked more about the surgery part. But so basically you insert the probe in the brain, which is this, you know represented here. This is the probe, the shank here is inserted in the brain. And then you're just going to cover it with uh, cement so that it's very stable. And you can record for some time, especially if you add a little protector like what they did in this paper here. And then for explantation, obviously, you can't or you have to drill it out, which can be very challenging. And if you've cemented the shank here, you can't. Okay. So now I'm going to move to the reusable implants and they work usually in the same way. There's a bunch of those you'll see. I've put them all on the same slide, all that I know of. And uh, they work with similar principles. And the main principle is you have these kind of modules here. So this is still the probe and these are two modules that you can either 3D print or order from some uh, company. And there's a payload module that you're going to assemble with the probe. And this is going to be like a permanent assembly. And there's a docking module here. And the idea is you're going to assemble these two pieces together. 
And in the end, you'll be able to recover the permanent one, so the, the payload module with the probe, while this one, the docking module, is going to stay on the skull to which it's attached, and you're going to lose it at the end, but it's not too bad because these pieces are uh, usually cheap. So yeah, if you insert it in the brain, you cement only the docking module, and then when you want to retrieve it, you actually detach the, these two pieces uh, from one another, and then you take it out and you can reuse it. Okay? So this is very simple uh, approach. Here are a few reusable implants. Um, so eight of them, there may be more that I don't know of or that I've forgotten, but these are the first ones that were developed mainly for NeoBixels 1.0. Uh, and then there's a, a bunch of different styles. This one was the first one to really use this kind of uh, payload and docking module approach. This is the one we designed here in the lab, trying to push it to be very uh, lightweight and easy to use and open source and so on. And then here are two other designs that I find pretty interesting because they allow you to implant probes with different angles, which is quite challenging. And I've put, uh, oh, yeah, just to mention th this one been designed with Pipco and Huna House, uh, his own lab. When you want to pick one of these uh, implants, because there's such diversities, for a good reason, it's actually because everyone has their own needs. So you need to ask you the question of many questions, uh, including which brain area you want to record from, and that means from which angle. So if it's just from the cortex, any of these implants may work, but if you're recording at a yeah, sharp angle, you may want to pick the ones that allow you to do that. Then do you have a limit on weight? If you're working with rats, you don't have such a limit or much less than if you're uh, recording from, uh, let's say, water restricted mice. How long do you need to record? Some stable, some implants may be more or less stable. Actually, I think it's usually more on the surgery side than the implant. And you need more flexibility. To help you kind of choose, I've tried to make and reuse from the past a, a table like this, where you have all the different implants that I've shown just before, the different organisms in which they've been tested, so mainly rodents, this one's been tested, tested once in ferret. Um, the brain areas, actually, most of them have been recorded in uh, various brain areas, the neuropixels version, and also the number of probes that you can insert. Uh, and so, you know, in the first ones, especially in mouse, it was one or two uh, probes, but now uh, some implants allow you to implant uh, up to six probes. Then the weight, it's very hard to quantify because it's in each paper it's described uh, differently, some people uh, tell you about the, the weight with cement or without, and then some features. I won't spend too much time on it because it's, it's a lot of details, but feel free to go back to it, the slides will be available. Now I'm going to go over um, a bit of results and what you can obtain with those um, uh, probes, especially the reusable ones. And the first thing you may wonder is how stable it is, how, how, how well can I hold my neurons uh, over time? And so here are all the different uh, figures you can find from uh, from all the different papers. And in each of these uh, plot, you have the number of days here and the number of units that were recorded. Um, and you can see that, you know, sometimes it decreases. Overall, it's quite stable. Uh, but one thing I want to mention is, you know, there's a it's highly variable across animals. Everywhere you look here, you can see that, you know, each line is usually one animal and it depends a lot uh, on the implant. Overall, it's for each of these implants it's possible to get good stability across month. Here we managed to record uh, and then we had to stop the experiment for a different reason, but for more than 100 days. Uh, here also very good stability for 40 days and here they actually recorded from a mice, from one mouse at least, for more than 300 days. So almost a year, also on this one. Uh, so it's possible to get good stability. And, you know, improving surgery techniques may actually have the biggest impact, and this is what we see in the lab, depending on exactly how you perform the insertion and so on. Another thing I'm going to mention briefly here, uh, and that you can see uh, here, actually, each color um, corresponds to a different brain area, and you can see that the stability may be very different across brain areas, and this paper especially has focused on trying to, to decipher uh, this question with the front of the brain, if I recall correctly, being more stable than the back. Um, yeah, so this is uh, the kind of conclusion you can get for stability. Another question you may ask related to the stability is, can you track the neurons? Um, so any is going to talk about the software that we developed here um, to do it, but here I'm just going to show it in, in the example of the reusable chronic implants. 
this is a population of neuron in the brain. So each dot is a neuron, and this is just a space in the brain that we recorded for, let's say, 100 days. And you can see here the waveforms are quite stable, and we know we are able to track these. The uh, interspike interval histogram is also very stable across days. So this is kind of the challenge, and this is something we're trying to push as much as we can with this, especially with the recoverable uh, implant, is to be able to track the same neurons across days. And overall, it's this is a you know a kind of summary of it. This is the number of days between recordings, and this is how well you can track the neurons, and you can see it drops uh, quite a lot, at least in our hands, and it varies a lot across animals. So you can do it. There's a lot of variability across animals. Another question you may ask is, what about reusability? Can we reuse these probes uh, over and over? And actually, here are a few plots that show you that, yes, indeed, we can. The x-axis is always the number of times the probe was used. And the y-axis is, um, you know, depending on the, on the plot, different things. It can be the recorded units or the, the change, the slope with which it decays or the overall noise in the recording. And you can see that uh, this is quantified here with the p-value. Actually, the, the probe use doesn't change anything. This is not just in our lab, but also other labs have been quantifying it, where basically uh, the number of times you've been reusing the probe doesn't seem to change much. Okay, it may still be an open question because it's something that's quite hard to quantify. Another question that's pretty interesting is, uh, what about reproducibility? Uh, is it uh, doable to, when one lab develops uh, one technique, is it easy to transfer to other labs? And this paper especially has been doing a great job at doing this, sharing their design with 10 different labs. You can see here the overall success, number of success of the implantation data collection, which means just recording and then explantation. You can see overall the success is really good. This is across all labs. And then here, this is break it down, breaking it down across different labs. So this is the initial lab that developed it with Daniel Register here, who was the one who developed it. And then he trained all these different people who themselves trained these different people. And these guys actually on the side are the labs that uh, used it without even direct training. And you can see that overall, this is well reproducible that people manage to uh, learn to perform these, these implantations. And this is in our lab here where, again, this number of recorded units, quality of, of recording as a function of days, and each color is a different lab, and many different labs have been uh, able to reproduce that. Okay, and this is actually very useful to these across lab kind of um, uh, uh, survey to understand the general needs and the bottlenecks where things seem to fail. One last thing is flexibility. I think this is a fairly important point, uh, especially when designing this implant at a time where many people are going to use new pixels. Uh, so here, it, it, I'm going to show here in our case because this is the one I know the most, but we've tried to develop something that's very easy to use and modify and print at home almost. And so you can adapt it to different probe types, but also add some external components like this head stage holder. So this is the probe that you can see here uh, sticking out the docking module, the payload module, and then this head stage holder, the head stage being that thing here. This has been designed actually by another lab with uh, which we collaborated. But also some people have been designing this miniature version, getting inspiration from the initial uh, uh, design and so on. Uh, we can also adapt them to bigger species. This was kind of an a casing for rats and uh, yeah, try to change different parameters. So this is all allowed by the fact that it's open source and flexible to um, uh, modify as a user. Uh, it should be pretty easy. And you know, other labs have also uh, done the same. And here, this is from this um, very nice uh, implant where they managed to implant six probes at the same time with different angles. And this design is also pretty easy to download, print, and modify. OK, uh, we can also do freely moving. Um, um, basically, not much to say about it, except that it's uh, doable with all different these different types. So, you know, your episode 1.0, but also with the head stage on, the miniature version, bigger species like this rat. Uh, we can quantify behavior. It's overall the same. And, you know, other labs have been designing the classic uh, poly um, design to uh, prevent the weight from uh, preventing the mouse uh, from moving too much. So preventing from moving. And also in, uh, some labs were interested in uh, social interaction. Sorry. OK. And just to conclude on that, there are still some challenges that are left. And then I'm going to conclude. 
Some of it is the stability. Um, it's still very viable across mice. We still need to improve surgeries and it may depend on brain regions. Tracking neurons can still be difficult. The weight and size is still hard and the, the NeuroPixel probe is still pretty big. So it's hard to get below two grams, everything included. And the height of the NeuroPixel probe can, be, uh, can impeach some movement. Flexibility, although this is very much helped by the fact that everything is can be made open source uh, and uh, modifiable by everyone. So angles, number of probes, probe geometry, this is all ongoing and improving every day. And finally, robustness, you may necessitate to shield in bigger species. Finally, just as a conclusion, this is an expanding field. Um, your implant choice will depend on your needs. And there are some remaining, remaining challenges that you may keep an eye on the new uh, developments on that side. And I'm going to briefly thank all the labs that partic participated to it and the Chronic Neurobixels community. Thank you.